Hi, and welcome to Power Hour. Weekly Power Hour, and now Video Power Hour, that is. Uh, some of you have probably seen me before on various videos debating Occupy Wall Street or Greenpeace or giving a talk, but for those of you who haven't, nice to see you, or have you see me, at least. Uh, this is, I'm very excited about this new format since I don't have to talk to a void anymore. I can, I can actually talk to our guests. Um, they can see me, you can see them, so hopefully uh, it'll be a lot more fun. Anyway, on to the show. Uh, today's show is about agriculture, which means it's about food. And one of the biggest movements in recent years has been the so-called local food movement. Uh, some of the people who subscribe to it are called locavores, uh, you know, as against carnivore and omnivore. And there's a very famous book by a very famous guy named Michael Pollan called The Omnivore's uh, Dilemma. And you may have read his articles in the New York Times, you may have read other things about this. And whether you are a rabid locavore or you don't think locavorism is very important, you need to hear today's show. Um, because I have just finished reading this book right here, uh, The Locavore's Dilemma by Pierre de Rocher, and I need to pronounce her, um, Named correctly, his wife, Hiroko Shimizu, hopefully he can correct me later if that is incorrect, but it's, it's phonetic. Anyway, these two uh, have put together an amazing book. Pierre's been on the show before, and it really opened my eyes to how big an issue this local food movement is, because it's not about do you go to your farmer's market, do you not go to your farmer's market. It's really about a movement that's trying to change the whole way that a society eats and really change it uh, by coercion. So Pierre's going to tell us all about this book. It's got fascinating historical um, facts, fascinating current facts, so I'm really looking forward to it. And with that, let's bring him on. Uh, Pierre, welcome to Power Hour again. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me again. Uh, great, great to have you. Um, let's see. Well, let's start with the title. What exactly is a locavore? Well, a locavore is someone who believes that we should cut down on food imports and increase uh, local food production. So it is often marketed as something like, you know, buying from your local food shed, which remains fairly vague. And this is one of the first problems that you encounter when you meet a locavore and you say, well, what is local? And so people have come up with this uh, highly arbitrary notion of 100 miles. But I'm Canadian. I was raised on the metric system, so that's like 160 kilometers. That, that, that doesn't quite make sense to me. And then you have uh, the USDA, I mean, your Department of Agriculture, that says something like, uh, it's either four, a 400-mile radius or a whole state. So, you know, California or Texas would qualify. <laughs> and then you have the biggest grocery chain in Canada that says, well, local is obviously a country, right? So, Canada qualifies as local, and we're the, lar we're the second largest uh, country in the world as far as land area is concerned. So, so that's the first thing. But in essence, uh, what the movement amounts to is, as I was saying, really to uh, cut down on imported food and replace it by things that are grown locally or at least closer to where people live. So I'm going to disagree with you on that, even though I didn't write the book. But reading the book... Uh, let me, let me just give you my context. I wasn't all that concerned about this movement until I read the book. But what the book made me realize is that local, and the reason I wasn't worried is just it seemed like kind of a stupid thing to say, oh, my food should be grown this many miles or that many miles. But what I realized from reading the book is it's not really, local is not, doesn't seem to be the essence of it. What seems to be the essence of it is really the man-made element of the modern agriculture industry. And what, yeah. what I saw throughout the book is that they oppose every element, including global trade, but not certainly yes. not limited to. So they oppose fertilizers. Um, they oppose. It's the, so it's the whole environmentalist, the modern green yes. perspective on food, and you see that in Michael Paul and everyone else. So could you yeah. elaborate on that? Well, okay, let me rephrase that. Then I gave you the narrow definition of what a locavore is, but they're part of a much broader uh, food movement that, as you say, built on older traditions like uh, organic farming, uh, people who are anti-globalization, people who don't want to depend on foreigners to feed them. So it's kind of a combination of uh, long-standing movements. I mean, uh, 
that's the problem with uh, current discussions of local food. People completely lack uh, historic, uh, historical perspective on the topic. So obviously, you've had food protectionists throughout history. You know, a number of political leaders really didn't like the idea of depending on foreigners for something as vital as food. Then you had the organic food movement that emerged in the 19th century as a reaction against synthetic fertilizer. You know, the idea was that, well, uh, just as von Liebig and organic chemists came along and they realized, well, we can feed plants by essentially giving them minerals. And the first organic uh, food activists were people who said, no, we need to feed plants with living stuff so manure, nothing else will do. And then uh, synthetic uh, nitrogen came along and then pesticides and other things. And uh, the organic food movement came to be, well, you know, if something is produced by nature or is produced by an animal, it's good. If it's produced by humans, uh, it must be bad because we're playing God with our groceries or the way we raise food. And this is a really bad thing. And so locavore, if you will, are kind of the latest generation of food activists that have incorporated this whole uh, anti-science, anti-technology movement. But the problem that they have is that you can now buy organic food at Walmart. And so what is an activist going to do? Uh, I mean, you cannot just say, okay, well, we've won. We find organic uh, food at Walmart and uh, that's it. Let's call it quit. No, you need to punish evil corporations and uh, you need to prevent uh, or to fight human hubris. And so what you're left with is this whole uh, local food movement, which, again, builds on all these traditions. And on top of that is also essentially a reaction against globalization. So there are perhaps as many different takes on locavorism as you have intellectuals writing about it, but I won't disagree with you. I mean, all I did at the beginning was to give you the narrowest definition I could think of, but then, of course, we could expand it uh, throughout the podcast if you want. Right. I mean, it, it seems with many of these movements, they'll often put up something as a smokescreen or seemingly appealing. And of course, none of us have any objection if we get, I live in California, if we have really good local strawberries and they're at a good price. I mean, why wouldn't I buy? There's yeah. no one. There's no anti-local. See, these movements no. often it's like environmentalism. Who's against environment? No one is. Yeah. But people are against sacrificing themselves to the non-human environment, and they they mix and match uh, those two. So you, you mentioned the issue of, of being against trade, and it seems like everything they're against is against the man-made. But what mm -hmm. they're also against is anything capitalist. So anything yeah. that one of the major points in the book that you make that I want to talk about later is that the modern agricultural system arose essentially out of freedom and voluntary trade. And what I want to focus on now is that the local war movement isn't simply making menu suggestions. They want to engage in coercive measures. Could you elaborate yes. on that? Yeah, that's the thing. Honestly, if it was just another local fad as you've had throughout history, uh, we would not have bothered writing the book. The problem is that uh, perhaps when the movement began a decade, a decade and a half ago, uh, these people were simply promoting a certain lifestyle or, you know, uh, a form of snobbishness, if you will, by uh, at some point you've got to stand, uh, stand out from the crowd, I guess. But increasingly over time, what they came to do was to mandate uh, local food purchases by, you know, school boards, universities, uh, military bases, public administration. A number of them are also opposed to developing land around thriving urban areas. I mean, where I live in Toronto, we have a provincial government which manages these things, which has created the largest green belt in North America. And so this is land that is essentially taken away from its owners and they're prevented from developing it. And the way that they have tried to sweeten the pill, if you will, was to say, well, we'll create a local food movement to make sure that you guys can stay in business and make money. So they're opposed to uh, land uh, development around thriving urban areas because they say, well, we'll give up our food security and we won't be able to have a local food movement if we pave over some good farmland. But increasingly, what you see is that the more... Uh, international, although this is kind of paradoxical, locavores are increasingly promoting food sovereignty, which is a form of protectionism that differs from what we have at the moment in as much as they say, well, uh, countries should have the freedom to refrain from trading with each other, but uh, they should not have the right to dump subsidized food in other markets. But in, uh, in essence, the movement is essentially a protectionist one. And so as you often see with, uh, I assume you're familiar with the bootleggers and Baptist analogy, but for uh, the, your listeners who are not, 
this is a metaphor that was put forward by economist uh, Bruce Yandel to explain why you have uh, dry counties in some parts of the United States. And typically what you see is an alliance between the Baptists or let's say the radical uh, religious zealots who uh, want to prevent the sales of alcohol and uh, alcohol smugglers who obviously get a better market out of this because they, you know they can sell uh, their booze at a premium when you live in a dry county, when you're not allowed to sell the booze on a certain day or even year-round. And so what you see with the local war movements is that you've got uh, idealists, typically suburban-raised kids who've never really grown food. They, then they plant a garden and they realize, oh my God, things grow by themselves. What a miracle. And it's fresh and I can see it. And the very old... Uh, you know, standard uh, farmers will use the latest technologies, but who would like to keep uh, cheaper food out of their local markets. And a number of other lobbies in between, you know, people who are opposed to suburbia, for example, will latch onto the local food movement because it gives them an excuse to prevent uh, the de redevelopment of agricultural land. So this is a movement that is complex, but in essence is essentially... Uh, Again, the intellectual inheritor of this uh, small is beautiful, nature is kind, uh, human should not play God with genes in our environment type of thing. And, you know, people who don't trust, uh, people who have a strong uh, tribal instinct, for lack of a better word, people who don't like strangers and foreigners. So, uh, well, that's the thing. So, again, uh, to sum up, if the movement was purely voluntary, if it were uh, only promoting uh, false ideas, that would be one thing, but increasingly it is becoming coercive, which is why, again, we wrote the book. And, and speaking of, of voluntary, uh, one of my, the book kind of has two, two big sections, or maybe three, but, but at the beginning, I mentioned this to you on email, there's, there's a section that I love about the evolution of global agriculture. And then after that, you take on many of the locavore myths, you know, Local farming creates a brilliant sense of community and love between you and the guy who grew your potatoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I want to at least start about by talking about the positive, because I think you really make clear how this romanticist idea of living in harmony with nature through agriculture is something that we evolved out of through, through achievements, through voluntary trade, and that it is not something we want to go back to. So could you sketch out the history sure. a little bit? Well, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of food activists today believe that uh, humanity had a very slight footprint on nature until agribusiness came along, which uh, occurred in North America sometime after World War II, let's say 1950s. The 1950s when uh, tractors became prevalent, when synthetic fertilizers became widely available. And uh, they sort of imagined that if we go back to the day of you know, grass-fed animals or organic agriculture, that we will somehow uh, behave um, in a greener way, or at least be uh, less uh, have less of an impact on nature. But what I do in the book is that I go back to say, okay, what were environmental activists saying in the 1940s? What were they saying in the 1850s? What were they saying 2,000 years ago? And what you see is that throughout history, you always have intellectuals from Plato to um, People that, uh, although you had Robert Zubrin uh, not too long ago, I guess, so William Voigt was the author of the biggest environmental bestseller before Rachel Carson came along called uh, Road to Survival. What all these people are saying is that humanity the world over is actually destroying nature. It's not because there are few people and that they're not very productive uh, growing food, that they don't have a, an impact on the land. Quite the contrary. When you don't have long distance transportation, you're forced to grow food in bad locations. So uh, wheat on hilly slopes, for example, um, you you're might be forced to uh, overfish uh, your coastal areas because you cannot uh, import food from other places. And so what I try to show in the book is that historically, old-fashioned, organic, free-range agriculture destroyed the landscape the world over. And what happened over time is that as long-distance trade became more of a reality, as better food preservation technologies came along, we were able to specialize, I mean, we, humanity, we were able to specialize food production in the best locations the world over. So instead of growing cereal grains, for example, in bad uh, uh, let's say mountain environments in Europe, people were able to grow them in North Dakota, in Argentina, in Australia, in flat plains, 
whose uh, dry climate was ideally suited to grow cereal grains. And so uh, people stopped farming uh, on productive lands the world over. And so nature actually made a comeback. And what we try to illustrate in the book is that uh, there is no, even my uh, left-wing colleagues will not argue with me over this because they're geographers and they know the history. Uh, the state of our environment has improved tremendously with uh, high yield agriculture and long distance trade because we have been able as a species to abandon the less productive and most erosion prone uh, spots in the world. And by concentrating food where it makes the most sense and by increasing yields, we've actually allowed nature to recover uh, the world over. I think you went to Duke, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So I'm sure that you've seen a lot of abandoned tobacco fields uh, in North Carolina, and a lot of them have uh, trees growing on them now, whereas a century ago you would have had uh, tobacco production. And say what you will about trees, but there's a lot less land erosion that way. And in that case, of course, tobacco uh, production went the way of the dodo, but in many other places uh, where people, again, were growing and crops or doing a lot of damage, nature has been allowed to uh, take over uh, those environments. Well, and as a result, much better off that way. Yeah, let me jump in there because th yes. this is interesting. And I was going to, um, like, you, you, when we emailed back and forth, you said you don't want me to go too easy on you. So um, yes. okay. I'm about to not go easy on you about Please. this issue. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, so in the book, you've gotten a lot of interesting polemics against the green uh, movement in terms of they claim this, you know, they, they, they've got this yeah. image of agribusiness is, is going against small is beautiful, whereas obviously yeah. organic food is going to take up much more space since it's much, yeah. has a much lower energy density, has a much lower yeah. crop density. Yes. But it doesn't, I mean, in terms of priorities, to me, that's, I wouldn't care if it took up more space, if, if, it, if it promoted human life. So it seems like the, the most important passages in the book are the ones not about nature making come back. I don't care about nature as such. I care about enjoying it, but I care about human beings. Yeah. And what you show in the book is that human beings were in an incredibly precarious state, both because they, yes. they didn't have the technology to grow a lot of food in the first place, and they were incredibly insecure because they were growing it in their own locales, which were inevitably not suited for 90% of, of food production. So could you elaborate on the, the, the human impact? Sure. Yeah, well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm a geographer. What can I say? I used to put nature ahead of people, I'm afraid. Uh, well, the point we make in the book is that throughout history, uh, people struggle with famine. I mean, we are several generations removed from this uh, reality in the Western world. And so we can't hardly imagine that uh, throughout history, not only were people uh, poorly nourished, because again, you were kind of limited in terms of what you could grow in your local environment, but typical uh, people would typically experience bad years. I mean, I'm Canadian, so and I grew up in the countryside, and of course, one of the main problems we have in Canada is either early or late frost. Frost will ruin a crop fairly easily. Doesn't matter what you grow, doesn't matter how diversified you are. Uh, if you have frost and if you're living in the 19th century and you haven't been able to harvest your crop in time, then doesn't matter, you will lose that. And historically what happened when there was very little in terms of uh, long distance food trade, two harvests in a row and you were in serious trouble. I mean, one harvest people could uh, could eat a little bit less and could hope to survive until the next one. But historically, two, harv two bad harvests in a row and you had a significant famine. So what we do in the book is to illustrate that famines and poor nutrition were the lot of most people in most places most of the time throughout human history. And that the one thing that put an end to that was long distance trade because when some people have bad years, while well, other people in other locations will have good years in terms of uh, crop production. And so the surplus of one area can be channeled uh, into another. And this is a reality that was uh, very well understood in the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And really what put an end to famine in, in uh, advanced economies were fossil fuels, uh, coal essentially, because you would have steamships and steamboats and people tend to forget that uh, early in the 19th centuries you can read accounts of people trying to move food in the, the American Midwest. You could not go up on the Mississippi River most of the year. The current was just too strong for the technologies that you had. So people would build rafts and ship, let's say, uh, pork meat, 
down from Cincinnati all the way to New Orleans, and then they would have to walk back up to Cincinnati because they had no way to go against the current. I mean, I guess people could have tried to row, but the fact that they walk uh, tells you something. Then the steam engines uh, come along, and you're able to ship goods from New Orleans to Cincinnati. And suddenly sugar becomes much more available in Cincinnati, coffee, and other goods that are uh, shipped from tropical locations. So prices go down drastically. Uh, across uh, oceans, well, people historically were limited by wind patterns and ocean currents. The steam engine comes along, you know, these problems are gone. I mean, the number of uh, trade routes that open up is remarkable. And on land, uh, historically, Moving goods from uh, Manchester to Liverpool or New York City to, let's say, the foothill of the Appalachians was historically as expensive as shipping them across the ocean. That's how inefficient and cumbersome uh, land transportation was. And so the railroad, again, is essentially what put uh, an end to famine in landlocked areas. And so in that, in that sense, fossil fuels liberated humanity from famine, at least in advanced economies, and in locations where people gave up on subsistence farming and became part of the international division of labor, which is, again, if you think about it, simple common sense, but somehow locavores don't think that can, things can go wrong in a local food shed, and that, again, two bad harvests in a row would be a disaster and would, be, would have been in previous time a sign of uh, an imminent famine. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's particularly bad with food, the insecurity uh, of just relying on your local weather conditions and crop because that's that's the basic thing. I mean, if if you go you put all work, your agri yeah you put all your agricultural eggs in one basket. And what I find amazing with locavores is that there you know there are people who worship diversity in all its form, except in terms of the locations where you produce food, in terms of supplying people. And it seems to me you know. Uh, insurance or risk management 101 would tell you well diversify you know but well that's not the yeah. kind i mean come on that's not the kind of diversity i mean their whole diversity thing is different i mean it's really bad because it's really treating people as member of, of racial tribes I, um, no, I, and they I, worship I, the but, primitive but that's tribes a, that, that's a rhetorical trick i use <laughs> with them well you guys love diversity you should love that kind of diversity too yeah. diversity of ideas too is another concept they have a problem with but yeah yeah they like bad kinds of diversity Yes, that's that's, that's uh, anti-capitalist forms of diversity is usually exactly. uh, the common denominator. All right. Well, let's let's I want to sort of pick apart even more this local, uh, this local really, but quote unquote natural uh, ideal. So we've talked so far a little bit about how in contrast to the view that if you only eat locally, your food supply is secure and greedy capitalists won't deprive you of it. It's in fact uh, much more insecure because you don't have this global network um, feeding you. Uh, one that I found particularly amusing was the, the idea about your local farm community and how if you, how, where you get your food from and, and who grows it and how much you interact with them should be a profound part of your spiritual existence. And the ideal is I just bought some peaches today and I don't know the guy who grew them and now I'm spiritually impoverished. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's funny because, again, I grew up in the countryside. I was not the one who was selling stuff um, at the, the Montreal market. And in those days, uh, the people I knew were selling that into uh, really uh, markets that were targeted at retailers. But somehow there's this notion that I don't really care who made my shirt, who made my watch. But food is different. And that's the thing with locavores. You know, they don't know who made their iPods. They don't know who made the software that allows them to connect people and food. But somehow food is different. Food is important. And if you don't think about it too much, you might say, well, yeah, okay, that, that's the one thing I'm willing to grant. You know, uh, getting to know your farmer will actually improve uh, your uh, social capital, at least your local social capital. But then you've got to ask yourself, well, why do we have retailers and wholesalers in the first place? And what we illustrate in the book is that, you know, there's this long tradition in the anti-capitalist literature that intermediaries are essentially parasites. You know, they don't add anything of value. They're just stand to make a profit between producers and final consumers. But then, the, and so, of course, uh, local food activists, like many other activists uh, before them, are trying to 
create a direct link between producers and final consumers. So in the jargon, this is known as community-supported agriculture. And the way the system works is that uh, you contact uh, a local farmer, typically through a website. You basically buy in advance uh, the food that these people will grow for you, and you quote-unquote share the risk with them, meaning that if they have a pest infestation or if uh, they have a drought or if they have bad growing conditions and they don't produce as much, as they'll promise you, well, you're willing to take a hit. And if they have a, a really bountiful year, then you enjoy the sort of agricultural surplus that they've created. But the problem, of course, is that intermediaries are not parasites. We would not have them if they did not play a valuable function. And so what locavores are slowly rediscovering is the importance of intermediaries. So typically what happens uh, in community-supported agriculture is that you have no flexibility whatsoever and you don't know what they will really bring you uh, one week to the next. So uh, typically the farmers that engage in these deals are against monoculture. You know, again, to get back to this idea of diversity, they really want to promote, they want to grow a diversity of crops on their farms and they have very sophisticated crop rotations. They might be producing blueberry one week and spinach the next and might throw in a few eggs, you know, if they have a uh, chicken coop uh, in the lot. But as a consumer, you don't really know what you're getting. So a typical outcome of community-supported agriculture is that, first of all, you will often get less than what you expected, or then you will get uh, some leafy vegetable that you don't know what to, what to do with, so a lot of it will end up in the compost. But worst of all, you will have no flexibility whatsoever. So what happens if the kids are going to summer camp and suddenly you only need to feed two people or uh, out of, let's say, four or five in your household? What are you going to do with all the food that, they, that you've bought in advance for essentially five people? Well, either you give it away or you, it ends up in the co uh, compost pile, typically. Or what if you have guests? And suddenly you don't have all the you don't have enough food and you need to go to the supermarket and you uh, need to buy extra food for your guests. And so typically what happened is either a lot of waste or a uh, budget busting uh, regular trips to the supermarkets because you've already paid in advance for things that uh, are kind of indeterminate in terms of what you're going to get. And so people end up wasting a lot of money through community-supported agriculture. And they're sort of reminded of the reality that, you know what, getting the exact amount of food that I need when I need it in a convenient way at my local supermarket is actually quite a remarkable feat. And it actually saves me money. And so what happens typically with those locavore attempts to, again, bypass wholesalers and retailers is that they shift the risk of food productions from, pro uh, from producers and retailers onto consumers. And this is why you can read numerous accounts on the web of people giving up on community-supported agriculture, saying, I don't know what to do with the stuff they're sending me. It's often poor quality. I'm uh, wasting a lot of time and money doing that because, of course, you've got to go pick it up at a location that is convenient to the producer, not to you. And so you end up spending more money and having less time and perhaps not having the time or money to invest in coaching a little league soccer or something like that. So in an attempt to help idealist farmers, you end up having less time and money to invest in other forms of social capital. And this argument, in my opinion, this idea of creating connections, you know, getting to know the people who produce your food, is the strongest one put forward by local food activists, and it doesn't resist analysis, and which, again, paved the way for the other arguments, which are even worse than that one. But again, uh, locavores are the intellectual uh, heirs, if you will, to a long line of anti-intermediary activists, but through uh, daily life and engaging in those schemes, that a number of them, I think, are beginning to slowly understand why we have retailers and wholesalers and the useful role that these people play. You know, one thing I like about the book in general is that there's a real appreciation and the, the kind of the animating question behind a lot of it is, why did these things emerge in the first place? Then there's yeah. a default assumption by people who are trying to coercively remake systems that what we have right now is garbage. I can find a flaw yeah. with it. So we should just make a system my way. And what that leads to is an incredible ignorance of how many problems have been solved by the current system and then the fact that the system can be self-correcting. That is, if you think there's too much corn in the American diet, you can try to persuade people that there's too much corn mm -hmm. in the American diet. Um, but one of the observations you made in the book that it seemed obvious in retrospect, but I didn't think about with this, oh, I'm best friends with my local grower, is A, 
farming takes a hell of a lot of time. So it's not yep. as if they have these hours a day to set, spend schmoozing with you. Yep. And, and then um, B, the money that you save on proper, on buying you know, proper food at a supermarket for a healthy food for a good price, that buys you time you can spend spiritually however you want. So you can spend it with your wife, exactly. with your kids, yep. not with the guy who happens to grow grapes who, you know, exactly. most people you meet in life, they're not going to be your best friend. Exactly. But beyond that, I mean, what people, uh, it's another dimension of that chapter. Uh, locavores are very naive in as much as they assume that the people they meet at the farmer's market are telling you the truth. And I, it turns I love out, this point. It, yeah. So, you know, if, if you Google uh, farmer's market and fraud, you get all those stories coming up. And you so, you know, you have people selling you food at the farmer's market. And sometimes the only thing that is local about the food is that it was bought at the local Costco. So, you know, because, uh, again, people have to understand historically, food activists were complaining forever that you cannot trust the people who are selling you food. Uh, Fly-by-night's operations have no interest in telling you the truth. So, you know, they might add, uh, again, I'm going back to the 19th century, they might add water to your beer or your wine, or they might uh, put uh, chicory into your coffee and, uh, you know, uh, peppers left over into something more valuable, uh, rice into rice powder into your cream, and so historically, the way markets dealt with that was often through the was typically through the development of brands. Uh, so you know, the Quaker Oats man, for example, was one of the first brands to emerge. And of course, the 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 people who created Quaker Oats were not Quakers themselves, but Quakers had a good image. But despite that, uh, what was good about Quaker Oats is that you knew exactly what you would get, and your food would not have been adulterated. Uh, and the bigger the business grows, the more susceptible it becomes to lawsuits. You know, John Edwards is again in the news. You know, today you have a lot of ambulance chasing lawyers, but in the past you would have had, you know, a food corporate or a chasing lawyers. So these people have an incentive uh, to promote quality because ultimately the only thing that they have is their reputation, their brands. And they, they'll go through uh, everything they can to protect it because that's their real uh, business currency. But at local uh, farmers markets, you have a lot of fly-by-night operations, people who are not worth suing, and people who have an incentive, it's sad to say, uh, to pretend that they're selling you something that they're not. So again, they might buy food at the local Costco and pretend that it was grown organically on a farm uh, 50 miles away. How do you know if the, that person is telling you the truth? I mean, most of them are probably probably are. But there have been a number of reports of, you know, journalists actually taking the trouble. Okay, where's your farm? Oh, it's this and there. And people that go to these farms and nothing grows there. And then they track the guy. And again, he went to a local Costco or something else. But nobody's going to bother suing him because it's not worth it. And ultimately, as organic food is no better than conventional food, you know, if you buy something at Costco, you won't poison your customers. People will never know. So psychologically, they might feel better about it. But they don't have a brand. There's not much at stake. And so uh, it's much easier, I would say, to um, fool people in a farmer's market than in the context, obviously, of a much larger business. Uh, let's, that's a good segue to organic. You had a lot of really interesting observations about the organic food movement. Um, talk about that in general. One thing I really like, I'd like to elaborate on is the issue of pesticides and what kinds of pesticides yes. organic fertilizer organic yeah. uh, farmers use because it's not that they don't use pesticides no that's the thing uh, organic farming is not about organic chemistry it's about organic with farm as an organism this is where it came from uh, originally people wanted to take a farm as more of a holistic thing but uh, the key the thing that people should understand about organic it's not a scientific approach it's a marketing approach and what i mean by that is that you don't define organic food by what they are but rather by what they are not and what they are not is based on inputs that are manufactured by human beings. So, for example, you might import uh, guano, and actually I should point out, perhaps we'll expand on that later, it's almost impossible to have both local and organic at the same time, by the way. So, uh, organic farming, for example, instead of using uh, nitrogen fertilizer that is built on nitrogen that was captured from the atmosphere and bonded with something else, will use, let's say, manure that has some level of uh, nitrogen in it. They might import uh, guano from uh, Peru, which is essentially desiccated bird dung, if you will. And using guano is okay because it's produced in a bird's stomach. But using nitrogen that was captured by human beings from the atmosphere and bonded with something else using natural gas and energy is somehow uh, unacceptable. 
So again, this is why I say that organic is defined by what it is uh, not rather than what it is. But ultimately, you know what? The plant doesn't care. A molecule is a molecule is a molecule is a molecule. So whether it gets its nitrogen from synthetic fertilizer or whether it gets it from guano, it doesn't care. Well, actually, it cares in the sense that uh, typically you can uh, come up with a much better balance and use a synth create synthetic fertilizers uh, that are much better suited to your crops than uh, bird poo that was created because, you know, a bird needed to excrete the stuff that it was not digesting. So... Uh, the evidence has been in for decades. Uh, organic food is uh, less productive, but it is also not better for you. And that's why for de a few decades now, organic farmers have been marketing their uh, wares as being uh, more sustainable or friendlier to the earth because they have absolutely no uh, proof that their food is better for human beings. And if they were to do so, they would expose themselves to lawsuit through truth in advertising. Of course, they're also lying in terms of organic being better for the environment because, as you mentioned, uh, organic agriculture is much less productive and we would essentially need to plow under all the forest that we have left. But another thing about organic, which people don't understand, is that even if they use manure, typically the manure will come from conventional dairy operations. If you want local manure, you often don't have a choice. So, you know, the cows might be fed antibiotics to facilitate digestions or to fight diseases. Uh, they might be fed genetically modified corn. But this is the manure that local organic farmer will use because they must, by definition, use manure. And uh, I don't know where I was going with this, but the point is that, uh, again, organic and local are not are often not compatible because uh, where, whatever you're growing, there might not be enough manure in one area and you might need to import guano or there might be other inputs that are missing. But essentially, uh, organic is an anti-human philosophy. It's an anti-human ingenuity, anti-human science uh, anti-science philosophy that assumes that a molecule created by quote-unquote nature, uh, oh yeah, okay, pesticides, that's where you were going to take me with that. Uh, it's perfectly okay in most uh, organic uh, systems or approaches to use old-fashioned pesticides that were around at the time of the Model T, which were based, let's say, on uh, arsenic or lead uh, to kill the pest, because the pest honestly doesn't care whether you're growing organic or not. Uh, Pests don't seem to be reluctant to eat genetically modified corn or something, or you know, genetically modified crops, uh, unlike people. And uh, when you grow organic stuff, you know, you must deal with pests like other people do. And uh, they use pesticides that are much older and much less efficient. And because they're less efficient, might actually promote uh, pest resistance more than more modern, more targeted, and more efficient. Uh, pesticides. So again, people have this conception that organic is simply, well, you know, you take a seed, you plant it in the ground, you bring in some manure, and you let nature do all the work. Uh, no, that wouldn't work because you would lose too much of your crop. So I don't know if that makes sense or if I'm rambling too much. But uh, Well, I, I mean, for me, the, the biggest point, as I mentioned at the outset, is this hostility toward the man-made. That seems to integrate yeah. uh, everything that, that they do. And what, what one of the things I really enjoyed was just how you show that all of these man-made things are incredibly beneficial and that to abstain from them is incredibly harmful. And in, in that vein, I don't know, you don't talk about this too much in the book, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this movement in the future of agricultural technology, because we have things mm -hmm. like golden rice and other things that are being held yeah. back and causing millions of deaths. What you do point out, though, actually, I should insert is just how all the different fortification of vitamins and foods had yeah. eliminated so many diseases. Because you talk a little bit about the achievements of the past and then the suppressed achievements of the future? Sure. Well, uh, feeding human beings is a complex thing. We're a complex organisms. Uh, people only discovered the role of vitamins, you know, vital amines, about a century ago. And what happened once people understood vitamins or the role of, let's say, zinc or iron and the other things that our body, uh, the other elements that our bodies need, is that... Um, Agribusiness made it possible to produce vitamins very cheaply. Some of them are actually produced by petroleum, which might, you know, make some people jump back and what vitamins are made from petroleum? Well, remember, petroleum was actually made of living things. And again, a molecule is a molecule is a molecule. So by having uh, agribusiness, economies of scales in food production, you can produce vitamins or you can collect iron or zinc or other things that are useful uh, to prevent, again, everything from blindness to uh, uh, fragile bone structure. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, to, trying to make sure that people understand me here, 
or stunted growth or poor vision uh, for lack of vitamin A or stuff like that. By having a large integrated operations, you can both produce vitamins and other elements very effectively. And you can also incorporate them in daily food staples uh, like salt, like flour, uh, other things that people eat. And so people tend to believe that the bread that we eat today is much less nutritious than it was 150 years ago. Well, no, because we've been able to fortify it. I mean, the loaf of bread that you buy today, uh, as far as human nutrition is concerned, is much better than it would have been 150 years ago because, you know, you might have a you might grow wheat in a soil that was lacking some element, and so your wheat would be of poor, of poor quality. Or else there might just be something that your body needs that is not in the wheat, uh, that is not in wheat to begin with. So by being able to fortify or to add positive things to the food that we eat and doing it through economies of scale, we've actually significantly improved uh, human life, longevity, the size of human bodies. Uh, the thing that always gets me with food activists is that they're always, well, you know, everything is killing us and you look at them. But, you know, a century ago, the average life expectancy in advanced economies was 47 years of age. Today, we're pushing towards 80. We're much taller than we are. Uh, yeah, we die of cancer at an old age now, but that's because we're not dying of other things before. We don't suffer from pellagra or other diseases uh, that resulted from a lack of uh, vitamins or again minerals or other things and so what's wrong look at us how can you see that everything is killing us when we're living so much uh, healthier lives we're living longer and the main difference between now and the past apart, apart of course from advances in medicine is that the food that we eat is much more nutritious than it was before because again we've been able to use our brains to make it more nutritious and to understand what is good for us and to uh, be able to produce it at a price that people can afford. So, um, and I think that that goes to the issue of, of the future because, as as we've talked about, it's not as if we say that every there's this false dichotomy of either everything is perfect or something's wrong and we need to abolish, you know, throw everything out. It's yeah. I mean, I could point to a lot of, to my knowledge, problems in the diet that people have, but the solution to that is obviously more freedom. So let's say you think. Yeah. People should eat more fruits and vegetables or, or more healthy meat. Obviously, the solution to that is going to be more improvements in the agricultural industry that makes those things uh, accessible to more people. Yeah, and more affordable, a, more diverse. And this, yeah. this pro-health movement is explicitly denying these even these earlier level improvements to the rest of the world. Uh, could you elaborate on that in terms of the golden rice fiasco and other things? Yeah. Well, uh, or let, let's begin with corn, for example. I'm kind of shocked today that uh, the, the level of hatred towards corn. I mean, corn is probably humanity's greatest feat in terms of uh, genetic engineering. I mean, it was thousands of years in the making, and it's really the thing that we that bears the most human imprint. I don't know how many of your uh, readers, uh, sorry, your listeners, have ever seen the wild ancestor of corn. Uh, it looks not thing like corn and we're not quite sure how it happened and perhaps you should talk to a geneticist about that but a few thousand years ago something really almost magical happened teosaint which is that kind of tiny tiny little thing with almost nothing useful to human beings was progressively transformed uh, into corn and corn is a tropical plant it came from uh, somewhere in central mexico and it would have first uh, have never survived in what is today the American Corn Belt. I mean, corn is a tropical plant that was modified beyond recognition and is now the best way to generate a lot of calories effectively on a piece of land. And so a lot of people today are like, well, you know, we should not feed cor uh, corn to cows because they've evolved to, they've evolved to eat grass. Well, nothing evolved to eat corn, not even human beings. It is a better alternative than what nature provided us. Humanity was able to create corn and feed a lot more people a lot more efficiently than in the past and also give us things like uh, year-round dairy products. I mean, people today tend to forget, or I guess they never knew, that if you had been to, let's say, uh, Boston or even perhaps all the way south then to uh, maybe all the way to northern Florida, I don't know, I'm not really know, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, uh, cows would only produce milk in the summer because that's the only time of the year where there was enough nutrition around them to uh, make, uh, give them the ability to produce milk at a significant level. Dairy cows did not use to produce milk in the winter. There was simply not enough nutrition available in terms of what people were able to feed them. You could keep them alive, but you could not give them enough nutrition to make them produce 
milk uh, year round. And with the development of corn and other types of animal feeds, uh, we were able to develop cows that are able to produce uh, milk year round. And uh, corn is also better for nature in as much as uh, it provides you a lot more nutrition. It provides a, a lot more nutrition to your livestock than, let's say, if you let uh, cows graze uh, in open pasture. So if you raise uh, a cow or a beef, uh, well, anyway, if people <laughs> cattle uh, on corn, they will be they will reach maturity, or at least in terms of uh, beef cattle, the, the times that we eat, in about 15 months. Whereas if you feed them in a pasture land, it might take as much as three years. In the process, they emit a lot more uh, greenhouse gases, if you believe that that is a problem, and uh, they don't give you the same quality of meat at the end. So corn has been a remarkable feat, and we've actually improved on nature. And that's what I think is the striking difference. I read a lot of old books. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an academic. I can afford to do that. And it is striking how the 19th century, a, the agricultural writings are all about this idea of improving on nature. And a lot of things today that local food activists or uh, organic food activists take for granted is that, well, nature gave us all this bounty and we should not mess with it. Well, no, our ancestors created this bounty by tampering with nature, even though this was more obviously of an empirical than a scientific approach. And they modified pigs, they modified cows, they modified chickens beyond recognition because they had this basic notion that we can do better. We can use our brain to use resources more efficiently, deliver better nutrition, have cows that can produce milk year-round, which is not something that we do today. And now uh, to get back to golden rice, well, what happens is that in many parts of the world, the people still don't have access to a very diversified food intake. And the problem is that it doesn't matter how high quality your local food is. If you're missing some elements, you might suffer from things like uh, blindness. In, the case of, in that case, it's a vitamin A deficiency mostly or uh, other types of diseases related to, again, uh, a lack of a specific uh, vitamin or mineral. And so what golden rice was about, it was simply to take uh, the type, uh, the stuff in carrots that makes a carrot orange, essentially, and combine it with, uh, with uh, useful strands of rice that people could grow in less advanced economies. And that way they would access a vitamin which they were lacking uh, and uh, which they are lacking in day-to-day -day diet. But uh, food activists are against that because of the way this was achieved, which is with modern technology. And often they don't know that, you know, a, way, a lot of the things that we uh, eat today, let's say ruby red grapefruit, for example, uh, not many people realize, and I'm a bit caricaturing here, that the stuff was created by essentially taking grapefruit seeds, throwing them in a nuclear reactor and see what happened at the end of the process. And, you know, people used to, throw, well, again, I'm kind of pardon the imagery here, but in essence, yeah, they would throw that in a nuclear reactor, then plant whatever came out of that and say, oh, that's not interesting. Let's throw that in the garbage can in the backyard. You know, it will end up at the municipal dump. Or else, oh, it's interesting. We've created something that we can call ruby red grapefruit. And this is how our quote-unquote natural food supply uh, was created. Uh, another thing that is uh, very popular with um, Local food activists today, well, anyway, a lot of healthy food, a lot of food that you buy at health store was created either through that process or using very toxic, toxic chemicals to induce mutation. But somehow having a better technology, our DNA technology or genetic uh, technology that creates genetically modified food, in which we know, uh, in which scientists have a much greater understanding of what it is that they're doing, in which they, are, they have better ways of controlling the reaction to this, in which they can select specific genes as opposed to mix mixing a bunch of things together and seeing what happens is not viewed as a step forward. But this would be to say, like, you know, uh, when you go to your doctor today, my sense is that not many locavores would like to be treated with 1940s medical technology. So, you know, they go there, uh, they, you know, you don't want to open your brain to see what's going on inside. You know, if you can get some imagery uh, without having an invasive surgery, people will not oppose to that. Well, why are things any different with the way we create better, more nutritious, more disease and drought-resistant food? So again, there's a lot of uh, irrational thinking in there, I think. Yeah, that, that I mean, um, it's going to have to be the last question, although I have, I have many. Um, but it reminds me of one of my favorite passages in the book, which I think is fairly early, where you, you describe nature and you contrast the true view of nature with the harmonious view of nature, which yeah. is that all of nature is just this wonderful place where we all get along. And I forget how you, how you characterize it, but I, I think of it as nature is a competitive system. 
So there are lots of things out there trying to eat us, insects that want to feast on our blood, and yeah. we have to win. And I mean, the more we tame nature, as long as we do it in a way that doesn't harm ourselves, but yeah. in general to benefit ourselves, we need to benefit. And unfortunately, that's a view that, that used to exist a lot more and that, that doesn't exist nearly well, enough used to, today. Well, it used to exist a lot more because people had to struggle with nature. And today we live, uh, we lead sheltered lives. I mean, um, I guess I'm like most people today. I want to know what the weather is like when uh, I get up in the morning. I turn on the TV. You know, I don't even bother uh, looking outside. And this is the kind of environment we live in. But, you know, if you live in, uh, I don't know, uh, a pioneer's uh, homestead in the 19th century in North Dakota, you will know what the, what the weather is like outside. You will know that there might be coyotes and wolves that want to eat uh, your livestock. Uh, you will know that there might be uh, snakes out there. You will know that insects are uh, really enjoying your crops as much as you are. And so people used to be confronted and uh, essentially struggle with nature a lot more than uh, people do today, obviously. Uh, I teach geography. I teach mostly suburban kids. I honestly don't know how many of them have seen a cows when they first show up with me. They're like 18 or 19. Perhaps they had a high school trip at some point. I mean... Uh, the area of Ontario where I live grows mostly uh, cereal grains and a few things like that. We don't, I mean, there's livestock in Ontario, but not that close to Toronto. So I sometimes uh, wonder how much they really know. And so it is very easy then to romanticize nature. Uh, you know, you listen to uh, your high school uh, teacher who probably did not have much experience growing food himself or herself, except maybe in their backyards. Uh, which is easier actually to do in a city than in the countryside because uh, an urban environment is less conducive to uh, pests that target certain crops. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I guess you know you have now. Um, uh, that's the statistics that I that I found when I was writing the book. You have actually more lawyers than farmers in the United States, and you actually have more people in jail than you have farmers, or at least full-time farmers. So we've reached a point in societal development where people have uh, been able to insulate themselves from the bad side of nature, which I think was a great achievement. But unfortunately, on the other end, it lets uh, people be. Um, prone to listen to people who tend to romanticize nature because usually when they go to nature it's in you know a national park or a nice environment uh, where the nasty stuff has been taken care of so uh, yeah again the contrast between the 19th century literature and the local food activists today is quite striking and if nothing else I hope that I've uh, helped bring some of that literature back to contemporary readers and help them understand how the world we live in, even what looks like wilderness, like for example, all those trees that you see in uh, North Carolina or Vermont are actually um, recent development in terms of people having modified the landscape in the past, then having moved to better farming areas and having late, uh, nature regrown. All of our surroundings have been profoundly shaped by human beings, even those that have very primitive technologies. But uh, people used to burn forests regularly, for example, leader for subsistence agriculture slash and burn agriculture, or else to create environments which would be more conducive to um, increasing the number of big games. You know, you burn a forest repeatedly, you have fresher grass, uh, fresher berries, deers, moose, creatures like that, like this. But over time, humans profoundly shape their environments. There isn't really a real untouched uh, nature around us. And I'll close with this. Uh, east of the Mississippi in the United States, there isn't one designated wilderness area because there is such a designation in the United States that hasn't been farmed at one point in time. It's just that it was abandoned some time ago. It reverted to something different than it was at the beginning. But uh, humanity's footprint is all around us. And in most cases, it's been obviously for the better since we live longer and healthier lives. And I hope that people who read the book at least get um, a better sense or at least a better appreciation of what our ancestors were able to achieve to give us the pampered lives that we live today. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I just said, so is that true of the Grand Canyon that was farmed? No, no, I, I said east of the Mississippi. Oh, east of the Mississippi. East, east of the Mississippi. East of the Mississippi, sorry. Yeah, but because... there were obviously natives in the Grand Canyon and Yosemite too. I mean, if I, if I were there, uh, there used to be, yeah, no, uh, people don't realize that in, uh, there, there used to be Native Americans in Yosemite and then they were expelled when the, the park was created, I believe. And you look at pictures of Yosemite in the late 19th century, it's very different than the environment today because, again, the na local natives used to burn the landscape repeatedly and what you see over time is that the forest made a huge comeback in what is now yosemite 
So, but anyway, you're from California. I've only visited Yosemite once, but uh, I could send you uh, documentation if you wanted to. Yeah, Even the quote-unquote wilderness areas of California were once. California used to probably have the highest density of human beings in North America. But what happened in the late 19th, in the uh, 18th century is that uh, European diseases came before colonists and most of the local population, perhaps as much as 90%, 95% of it died. And so trees grew back, uh, game uh, animals became a lot more abundant. And so the California that the first white settlers uh, encountered had very little to do with what California would have been a century or a century and a half before. But I guess that's for another debate. All right. So to wrap up, tell us where to get the book. Well, uh, you get a very good discount on Amazon.com at the moment. Yeah, if I can use it with the cover. Yeah, I, I, yeah I always if throw I can the covers away. <laughs> well, you see, that's a little debate that I had as a geographer with my editor. I don't know if I should be saying that, but I wanted a container boat. Uh, instead of a truck on the cover. But I was told by my publisher that Americans don't know what a container boat is, even though uh, a container boat is really what makes uh, our global food supply chain uh, go around. So uh, I've created a website, uh, globovore.org, where I provide links to all sorts of online booksellers. So I won't uh, publicize one more than another. But I'll just say that you can get uh, very good discounts at this point in time, especially if you're willing to buy a Kindle edition. Somehow somebody at Amazon thought that it was an interesting book, and you can get it very cheaply that way. All right. Well, if I hadn't gotten my free – well, I'll still get a Kindle edition. That's the <laughs> only way I, I accept books now. But I did get this free review copy, which is what yes. enabled us to have the show. It releases officially tomorrow, right? On, yes, well, I, mean, I don't know when you are airing this, but yeah, 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 that's true. We're airing on a Saturday. I might be tempted to release it a little before, but we're we're on a Monday sure. right now doing this interview. So, and so by the time it, you, it get is, it, you get it, get it. I see this by this podcast, it will be uh, widely available. Yeah, it'll be widely available. So for sure, get a copy, Pierre. Thanks for coming on. Uh, a pleasure as always. And hang on a minute, and I'll talk to you after the close. All right. Thanks again to Pierre De Roche for coming on uh, Power Hour. Um, one, I want to close with this point, which has to do with education. I'm sure you heard during this show many, many facts that you haven't heard, um, but more broadly, that you heard a, a perspective on nature and man's relationship to nature and also trade and capitalism that you haven't heard before. And it's, I often think of this as the secret history of our environment or the secret history of capitalism. One of the things I really like uh, about Pierre is that he has an expert uh, concrete knowledge of this. And I just want to say in closing that it's really important that we learn the secret history of environment, that we learn the secret history of capitalism. And that's a lot of what uh, we're trying to do at Center for Industrial Progress is create resources where we teach you both um, how to think about these issues in terms of how the issues actually fit together and then give you the historical context to understand where we draw these conclusions from, what the evidence is for them. Um, because a lot of the way that the other side succeeds is by creating this false mystique. And because we don't have the concrete knowledge to refute it, it seems plausible. But the more we know about how human beings actually improve their lives through industry and energy and progress, the less plausible these things are and the more stories uh, we can tell people. So that's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the first video power hour, the second weekly power hour. Make sure to tune in next week. Make sure, make sure to sign up on iTunes. And for all of your industry energy needs, go to www.industrialprogress.net. Um, I welcome any kind of feedback. So to give that to me, you can email me at alex at industrialprogress.net. Love mail, hate mail, whatever you want, send it to me. I always love uh, receiving it. So until next week, this has been Power Hour. Thanks for watching.